The atonement of Jesus Christ is one of the most difficult concepts to understand, let alone teach and explain to people. It is also the most important subject we could ever learn. In other words, if you could understand any one topic in the gospel, I pray you understand this one. Well, on the surface, it may seem simple. Most analogies, similes, stories, and explanations fall short of accurately describing the hows and whys of the atonement. Furthermore, even if it can be explained accurately, the magnitude of this act and sacrifice is beyond our ability to comprehend. Yet, understanding the atonement to the extent that we can is one of the most important things that we can do. Without it, we will never even partially understand what our Savior did for us, which was the greatest act of love ever shown. Let's start by first making it clear that the reason Christ performed the atonement is because he wanted to remove all barriers for you to return to live with God and be happy forever. That is why he did it. That is why we have the atonement, so that you can have a clear path back to your Heavenly Father if you want to take it. Without the atonement, even if you wanted to return to Heavenly Father, you couldn't. It explains why he did this in Doctrine and Covenants section 18, verses 10 through 12, where it says, Remember the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. For behold, the Lord, your Redeemer, suffered death in the flesh. Wherefore, he suffered the pain of all men, that they might repent and come unto him. And he hath risen again from the dead, that he might bring all men unto him on conditions of repentance. To understand the atonement, we must first understand sin. For our words will condemn us, yea, all our works will condemn us, we shall not be found spotless, and our thoughts will also condemn us, and in this awful state we shall not dare to look upon our God, and we would fain be glad if we could command the rocks and the mountains to fall upon us to hide us from his presence. Sin separates us from God. It's really that simple. Moses 6, 57 says, Wherefore, teach it unto your children that all men everywhere must repent, or they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. For no unclean thing can dwell there, or dwell in his presence. This is emphasized further in Helaman chapter 14, verses 18, which says, But whosoever repenteth not is hewn down and cast into the fire. And there cometh upon them again a spiritual death, yea, a second death, for they are cut off again as to things pertaining to righteousness. So for reasons we can't yet fully appreciate, sin drives us away from our Father in heaven, and repentance is required to return. It may seem strange, but when we were in our pre-mortal state, we knew that the only way we could continue to progress and become like our Heavenly Father was to come to earth. That would mean getting a body and we would commit sin. By committing sin, we would have been permanently separated from God and we wouldn't progress any further. The atonement of Christ makes it possible for us to still return to God by having someone else, Christ, pay the penalties for our sins. So sin, breaking God's commandments, causes the separation. Sin has a lasting effect. Without the atonement, For example, you can steal something, which is a sin, you can then return it, you can say you're sorry, and the person that you stole it from can forgive you. But according to the law of God, that is not enough. There is something more that has to be done to have sin fully erased. The reason making restitution and saying you're sorry are not enough is because of the residual effects of sin. All sin have a residual effect, whether you see it or not. Like dropping a stone in a lake, it creates ripples across the surface of the water. If the stone is the sin, once dropped into the water, even if you reach down and pull out the stone, the ripples still roll across the water. The sin has a residual effect, and simply saying you are sorry and removing the stone does not eliminate those ripples. For example, someone might think that looking at pornography all alone is only hurting themselves and no one else. Yet the sin modifies that person's mind and spirit and future behavior in subtle ways, both in the short term and in the long term. They treat other people, especially those of the opposite sex, differently. They treat their spouse or will treat their future spouse differently. These ramifications can impact children and go on for generations and generations. Like it says in Exodus 20 verse 5, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Let me illustrate this further. If you take a clean white piece of paper representing each of us as a pure and clean individual, then sin enters. I spray water on that sheet of paper. The water in the bottle represents sin. 
it begins to disfigure the paper. You can blow on the paper to dry it, meaning to get rid of the sin. But there is a lasting impression on the paper. It is wrinkled and warped. Even though the sin, i.e. water, has been removed because the paper is now dry, there is lasting damage. Even a hot iron cannot fully restore the paper to its original condition. I think a hot iron might probably make a good metaphor as well. This is why we need our Savior and His atonement, because He, and He alone, can repair the paper to its original state. He alone can remove the impacts and ramifications of sin, so that we may be clean and pure and return to live with our Heavenly Father and be happy forever. But how does the atonement actually work? To illustrate how the atonement works, think of sin like a poison. Each time you sin, you put a drop of the most deadly poison into a glass vial that hangs around your neck. You can't return to God or be happy eternally if you have any poison in that vial. The only way to get rid of the poison is to drink it. Unfortunately, if you drink the poison, it will kill you physically and spiritually. You will forever be banned from God's presence, be damned, and miserable forever if you drink the poison. Anyone else with poison in their own vial can't drink your poison because they have their own they have to deal with. The only person who can drink your poison other than you is someone who doesn't have any poison in their vial. Jesus Christ was perfect and never committed any sin. This is one main reason that qualifies him to drink others' vials of poison, i.e. sin. When he does this, he feels all the effects any one of us would. Perhaps this is why it's referred to as the bitter cup. He is not spared from any of the effects of the poison. But he does not die because of his divine nature with God the Father being his physical father and how far he progressed prior to and during this life on earth. Christ himself describes the power in John 10 verse 17 and 18 this way. He says, I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Christ didn't want to complete the atonement if there was any other way. This was the most horrific thing ever endured by anyone. He said, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. The pain and suffering Christ felt is something we cannot even begin to comprehend. Doctrine and Covenants, section 19, verses 16 through 19 says, For behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent. But if they would not repent, they must suffer even as I, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain, and to bleed at every pore, and to suffer both body and spirit, and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. Nevertheless, glory be to the Father, and I partook and finished my preparations unto the children of men. So Christ qualifies to drink your poison because he has none of his own. He can survive drinking the poison, i.e. sin, because he is immortal, although he suffers all of the effects of drinking the poison. He chooses to drink the poison because he loves you and wants you to return to our Heavenly Father where you can be eternally happy. The atonement is not an object or ordinance or other being. It is the name we give these series of actions and sacrifices that Christ performed on our behalf, namely his suffering in Gethsemane, dying on the cross, and resurrection. It means at one In other words, through Christ's sacrifice, we can be at one with God. We can return to God even though we committed sins. Through those supernal acts by Christ, in which we can only understand in a very small way, we can return to God if we believe on Christ, repent, and follow Him. But the removal of sin, allowing us to return to God and to be happy, is only part of the power and benefit we get through the Atonement. Let's get into the components of the Atonement. Elder Dallin H. Oaks, in the October 2005 General Conference, said, In mortality we have the certainty of death and the burden of sin. The atonement of Jesus Christ offsets these two certainties of mortal life. Physical death happens to each one of us. We will die. When Adam fell, it brought mortality into the world, and now we must pass through death. The second problem is even worse, spiritual death. As I mentioned before, sin causes a separation from God, and if that can't be repaired, we can never return to his presence, which is called spiritual death. 
Jacob in 2 Nephi 9 verse 6 and 7 describes it this way, For as death hath passed upon all men to fulfill the merciful plan of the great Creator, there must needs be a power of resurrection. And the resurrection must needs come upon man by reasons of the fall. And the fall came by reasons of transgression. And because man became fallen, they were cut off from the presence of the Lord. Wherefore, it must be an infinite atonement. Save it should be an infinite atonement, this corruption could not put on incorruption. Wherefore, the first judgment which came upon man must needs have remained to an endless duration. And if so, this flesh must have laid down to rot and to crumble to its mother earth to rise no more. So through some kind of power we don't understand, when Christ suffered in Gethsemane, he took upon himself all the sins of the world, from anyone and everyone that would believe on his name, repent, and follow him, overcoming spiritual death for each one of us. Then, after his crucifixion and three days in the tomb, he had amassed the power to resurrect himself and through this godly power also ensured that each and every one of us that has come to this earth someday will be resurrected with a perfect body. Lehi sums it up well in 2 Nephi chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Behold, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin, to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. Wherefore, how great the importance to make these things known unto the inhabitants of the earth, that they may know that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah, who layeth down his life according to the flesh, and taketh it again by the power of the Spirit, that he may bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, being the first that should rise. These elements overcoming spiritual death and physical death are two great mercies extended by our Savior, and in fact, what makes him our Savior. He has saved us from eternal physical and spiritual death, but this healing is universal and transcends even beyond this. Elder Groh stated it this way, Through his atonement, he heals not only the transgressor, but he also heals the innocent who suffer because of those transgressions. As the innocent exercise faith in the Savior and in his atonement and forgive the transgressor, they too can be healed. If you are suffering from feelings of guilt, remorse, bitterness, or anger, or loss of faith, I invite you to seek relief, repent, and forsake your sins. Then, in prayer, ask God for forgiveness. Seek forgiveness from those you have wronged. Forgive those who have wronged you. Forgive yourself. Go to the bishop if necessary. He is the Lord's messenger of mercy. He will help you as you struggle to become clean through repentance. Immerse yourself in prayer and scripture study. As you do so, you will feel the sanctifying influence of the Spirit. The Savior said, Sanctify yourselves, yea, purify your hearts, and cleanse your hands before me that I may make you clean. Some people want the atonement to do things that it just simply can't, such as eliminate any and all consequences of sin. Elder Richard G. Scott, in the October 2013 General Conference, addressed it this way. He said, It is a fundamental truth that through the atonement of Christ we can be cleansed. We can become virtuous and pure. However, sometimes our poor choices leave us with long-term consequences. One of the vital steps to complete repentance is to bear the short and long-term consequences of our past sins. The joyful news for anyone who desires to be rid of the consequences of past poor choices is that the Lord sees weaknesses different than he does rebellion. Whereas the Lord warns that unrepentant rebellion will bring punishment, when the Lord speaks of weakness, it is always with mercy. To better appreciate the atonement, I think it is important to try to understand what would happen to us if Christ didn't perform the atonement. Again, Jacob in 2 Nephi 9 verse 9 says, and our spirits must have become like unto him, and we become devils, angels to a devil, to be shut out from the presence of our God, and to remain with the father of lies in misery like unto himself. Now stop and realize that you signed up for this. You knew the consequences of trying to continue to progress. You did it with the hope that Christ would in fact go through with it. But the power of the atonement doesn't stop there. 
We have just been talking about the redemptive power of the atonement. There is also what we call the enabling power of the atonement. The enabling power of the atonement helps us overcome temptation, addiction, weakness, and other conditions brought on through our physical body or through Satan's influence. We can call on the power of the atonement through Christ to help us remove these cankerous imperfections. I have often heard the terms mercy and grace used interchangeably. I have even seen their precise definitions being swapped back and forth by ancient and modern-day apostles and prophets. I'll probably do a deeper dive on this subject in another video, but for the purpose of brevity, I like the following quote by Tad R. Callister from the April 2019 General Conference. Because of his atonement, the Savior has enabling powers, sometimes referred to as grace, that can help us overcome our weaknesses and imperfections, and thus assist us in our pursuit to become more like him. So here is one way I choose to look at this so I can better understand it for myself. Again, these terms are often used interchangeably, so I'm taking creative license here. Mercy is the power of the atonement that lifts us out of the pit of sin and allows our bodies to be resurrected, while grace is the enabling power of the atonement that can help us master ourselves and become more like our Savior line upon line and precept upon precept. Again, with some creative license here, I would say that the redemptive power of the atonement happens here as part of mercy, and the enabling power of the atonement happens here as part of grace. Now, this is overly simplified, I understand. In reality, they work together seamlessly in our lives. Elder Bednar states it this way, I'm not trying to suggest that the redeeming and enabling powers of the atonement are separate and discrete. Rather, these two dimensions of the atonement are connected and complementary. They both need to be operational during all phases of the journey of life. In the Bible dictionary, in our scriptures, we learn that the word grace frequently is used in the scriptures to connotate enabling power. The main idea of the word is divine means of help or strength given through the bounteous mercy and love of Jesus Christ. In my personal scripture study, I often insert the term enabling power whenever I encounter the word grace. And he shall go forth suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind, and that this the word might be fulfilled, which saith that he will take upon him the pains and the sickness of his people. Thus the Savior has suffered not just for our iniquities, but also for the inequality, the unfairness, the pain, the anguish, and the emotional distress that so frequently beset us. There is no physical pain, no anguish of soul, no suffering of spirit, no infirmity or weakness that you or I can ever experience during our mortal journey that our Savior did not experience first. However, the power of the atonement goes beyond even all of this, beyond the power to redeem us from the fall of Adam and save us from sin and resurrect us and help us overcome the world. Christ even suffered through our afflictions and infirmities. He felt our sorrows and all of our pains. I want to dive a little bit deeper into that scripture that was just quoted by Elder Bednar in Alma. Alma stated it this way in Alma 7, verses 11 and 12, And he shall go forth suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind, that his bowels may be filled with mercy, that he may know, according to the flesh, how to succor his people according to their infirmities. Every disappointment, sadness, pain, infirmity, and every other emotion you have or ever will experience, Christ chose to experience that so he can know best how to help you overcome those challenges and find eternal happiness. His healing salve can come in several forms as stated by Elder Callister. How does he accomplish this? Sometimes he removes the affliction, sometimes he strengthens us to endure, and sometimes he gives us an eternal perspective to better understand their temporary nature. So how much did Christ suffer to accomplish all of this for us? Doctrine and Covenants 19 verses 18 and 19 says, Which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore, and to suffer both body and spirit, and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. Nevertheless, glory be to the Father, and I partook and finished my preparations unto the children of men. 
As you continue to study the atonement, one place I would suggest you spend a few minutes is watching Bruce R. McConkie's final testimony, which he gave in the 1985 General Conference, just a few days prior to his death. It is called The Purifying Power of Gethsemane. I'll post the link here. I can't tell you how much I've learned and grown from watching that so many times throughout my life. So now, with hopefully a greater understanding and a bit better appreciation for the atonement of Jesus Christ, stop and think again why he did all that. He did it for you, and he did it for me. He did it because he loves us and wants us to return to him. He wants to remove any and all barriers that could ever get in the way of you reaching your full potential and complete happiness. That is why the atonement is the greatest gift ever given. That is why Christ is our Savior. That is why Christ's life and mission was so important. That is why we celebrate his birth at Christmas and his resurrection at Easter. Do you know any other event that was celebrated before it ever even happened? I mean, Passover was both a celebration of when the angel of death passed over the children of Israel, saving them, but also looking forward to when the Savior would again save them from death and hell. This is why all sacrifices prior to his birth was a similitude of the sacrifice he would make. And this is why the sacrament blessing asks us four times to remember, remember his sacrifice for us. And each time we partake of the bread and water with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, we think back to the meridian of time when that sacrifice was made for us. We literally owe everything to Christ. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks so much for watching.